My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm in the upper ancient district of Ephesus. And I'm standing in one of the entryways to the Bulletarian. Bulletarian is a derivative of the word bullus, which means to counsel. Bulletarian is the place where the city counselors met. And if you had been allowed to peek into this place 2,000 years ago, you would have seen illustrious, dignified men walking through these entryways to occupy these seats, dressed in beautiful Roman togas. Wow, they came looking their very best because it was a privilege to be a leader in the city of Ephesus. Well, it's even a greater privilege to be a leader inside the house of God. Wow, if you qualify to be a leader in God's house, Think how amazing that is. It is a privilege to be a leader. Who should be a leader? Should you be a leader? Do you qualify to be a leader? Maybe you thought, oh, that's so far from me. Mm, maybe not so far. Depends on what the word leader means. And when we come to 1 Timothy chapter 3, we find that the Apostle Paul uses a word for a leader which is very broad. It includes people who serve in every single area of the church and of the ministry. And Paul says it is essential that anyone who stands in any kind of leadership position does not have an issue with covetousness. That's what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. He cannot be a person who has covetousness. What in the world is covetousness? And how do you know if you are covetous? How do you know if you're covetous? What is the measure to let you know whether you have covetous working in your life or if you are free from the love of money? That's a very important question to God. And so it needs to be an important question to you. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. Hey friend, this is Rick Renner. Thanks for turning on your TV or your device and letting me come right into your space today. Today we're going to return to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul told Timothy how to choose leaders. And today we're going to continue studying every one of those points to find out what are the qualifications for leadership. But before we do, I want to tell you that if you need prayer, call us. The number's on the screen. We would love for our phone to ring and take your call so we can begin to pray with you for whatever it is that's on your heart in this very moment. Or send us an email. And when your email shows up in our inbox, we'll take it, we'll begin to pray over it, and we will continue to pray with you until you get the answer you need from the Lord. We believe in prayer, and we would count it an honor to pray with you. We're offering you my series, which is called qualifications for leadership. Now, don't look at that and say, oh, well, that's for somebody else. That one's not for me. Of course, it's for you. God has called you to be a leader in your family, a leader with your children, a leader with your friends. God wants you to be a leader among your friends. You need to be a leader in church. There's all kinds of places where you're called to be a leader. And we need to know what the Bible says about leadership, what it is, and what God expects of people who are in a leading position. God wants that to be you. So you need to hear this series. It's 10 parts. It comes in multiple formats, and it comes with a study guide. The study guide is so great. You know, we decided several years ago to put study guides with all of our series because when you hear the Word and see the Word and then you read it, it really reinforces what you're studying and puts it deep in you. And so we want you to be sure to get the study guide as well. And on our website, you'll see that we have lots and lots of different study guides. All of them are just terrific. They're loaded. They would be great for you personally or to share with a friend or a Bible study group or a Sunday school class. And we're also offering you right now my book, which is called Promotion. The full title is 10 Guidelines to Help You Achieve Your Long-Awaited Promotion. The subtitle says powerful principles to help you determine if you or someone else is ready to be promoted into new realms of authority and responsibility. You will love this book. And I want to say thank you to those of you that are partners. Partner, thank you. It is such a privilege that together 
we can do the work of God. And I'm so grateful for you. Denise and I pray for you every day. And what you're doing right from the privacy of your home really is making a difference in people's lives. And if you're not a partner, but you watch this program every day and it's a blessing to you, would you please be a part to make it a blessing to somebody else? Just go online, become a partner or call us and we will immediately send you a couple of books. This is our way of saying welcome to the partnership family. And of course, a partner is somebody who financially regularly supports the ministry. And these books are dedicated to partners. So we send these particular books to you the moment you join the partner family. But today, let's go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3. I've got my Bible. Hope you have your Bible. We always use the Bible in this program. And today we're going to return to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. We're going to quickly review what we've already taught and then add the next points. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1, Paul is writing to Timothy. And again, Timothy needs to choose new leaders. He has uprooted and removed leaders that have been rebellious. And now he has vacancies in the church. Who is he going to choose to fill those vacant positions? He wrote to Paul and he said, Paul, I need help. I have vacancies. I don't know who to choose. How do I choose leaders? What are the qualifications for leadership? Paul answered him. And Paul's answer is called 1 Timothy. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he begins to answer Timothy's questions about how to choose leaders. And he says in verse 1, This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Let's quickly cover this again. First of all, he says, a man. In Greek, it says, tis. It's open to everybody, male or female. It is gender neutral. A better translation would be, if anybody desires the office of a bishop. This word desire, the Greek word orego, means to stretch forward, to reach toward. It describes that longing or craving or yearning ambition, a real hunger to have something or to be something. You know, when a person has desire, they're never going to stay where they are. A person with desire, you cannot lock them down. There's no law of gravity strong enough to hold a person down who has desire because desire breaks free. Desire is reaching forth. And Paul says, make sure you choose somebody that has desire. And Paul puts this at the top of the list. And so my friend, if you want to be used by God, look at yourself and ask, do I have desire? If you find that you have a low level desire, ask the Holy Spirit to stir it up inside of you because desire will push you forward to become something. And Paul says, if anyone desires the office of a bishop, that's King James. The word office does not appear in Greek. It simply says bishop. The word bishop is a Greek word, episkopos. It shouldn't really be translated bishop. It's from the word epi, which means over. The word skopos, which means to look. Compound the two words together. It forms the word episkopos, one who looks over, one who observes, one who surveys, one who has oversight, or it describes anyone in a managerial, supervisory, or administrative position. Anyone that is responsible for, now listen to this, people or projects. People or projects. So it could describe the pastor of the church, because over the whole church. It could describe the janitor of the church. He's over a project. It describes people or projects. So regardless of what is the position, we find that God's standard is the same for all. And this verse really means if anyone desires to have a visible leadership position, he desires a good work. The Bible says it's good. In fact, that word good is a Greek word which describes excellence or something that is noble. You know, years ago when I first moved to the Soviet Union, of course at that time the Soviet Union had been communist and there wasn't a lot of ambition. People didn't have dreams for themselves. People really didn't have ambition. And when someone would appear to have a little ambition, people would say, oh, that's such an ambitious person, as though that was negative. But you know what? It's better to have ambition than to be dead. An ambitious person wants to become something. And in this particular case, when you have ambition to become a spiritual leader, this verse says that's noble. That is good. That is excellent. God wants you to desire spiritual leadership. 
Then when you come to verse 2, Paul continues, and he says, a bishop then must be. Must be, in Greek, is the word de, spelled D-E-I. It describes an obligation or a necessity. So now Paul is describing something that is essential. It is obligatory. It must be. A bishop then must be. The word bishop, again, is the Greek word episkopos. A visible leader must be blameless. Again, the word blameless does not mean perfect. You're not perfect. Your pastor is not perfect. Your spouse is not perfect. I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect. Only one was perfect. That was Jesus. Praise God for Jesus. But you don't have to be perfect to be blameless. In fact, you can be imperfect and be blameless at the same time. This word blameless, as I've already told you, describes one who once had a bad testimony or a reproachful past, but regardless of how reproachful or shameful that person's actions once were, this word blameless means that now their reputation has been restored. Former blame has been removed. Now the individual is blameless. In spite of a lurid past, there is now nothing to disqualify this person because blame has been removed and now he is blame free. For example, if a person had a bad testimony about paying his bills, you could say he was blamed in that area of his life. But if he has corrected his testimony, what may have been true about him in the past is no longer true of him now because now he pays his bills on time. In fact, he doesn't even have any bills because he has no debt. He is blame free. Though once he had blame, now he has become blame free. And this holds out hope and promise for everyone. It doesn't matter what you've done wrong. You can bring correction to yourself and become blameless. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. It just means there's nothing in your character so bad that it would hinder other people from following your leadership. That's really what the word blameless means. Then it says the husband of one wife. We've already seen this Greek phrase really means commitment to your present marriage. Then it says vigilant, blameless, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. The word vigilant, the Greek word nephalios, which means sober, not like a silly drunk. Paul says to Timothy, if you're going to choose somebody to stand in a position of leadership, they need to understand that perception is the name of the game. Perception is very important. If people perceive them just to be silly, nobody will want to follow them. Furthermore, if they are silly, that's what they're going to replicate in any department that you put them over. Do you really want silly departments and silly fruit? Do you really want that? Then choose somebody, Paul says, that is vigilant. Someone that is serious, not silly all the time. Then he said somebody that is sober. The word sober means a sound mind, reasonable or balanced or level-headed in the way that he thinks. Sometimes people are extreme. They're extreme in their emotions. You can see it in their relationships. They're extreme in their finances. That's why their finances are messed up. They're extreme in their marriage. They're just extreme. Well, if you choose an extreme person, what do you expect they're going to produce? They're going to produce something extreme, something probably imbalanced. You see, the Holy Spirit is so practical. He's not being judgmental of people. He's just being real about people. He's saying, look at what you're putting in position because what they have in them is what they're going to replicate in any department or any division that you put them over. Then he says, of good behavior. This is the Greek word, kosmias. From the word cosmos, which describes something that is ordered or something that is orderly. It's where we get the word for the cosmos, like the universe. It's where we get the word for cosmetics, which means when a woman puts on cosmetics, she's trying to order her face. That's really what it means. But in this particular case, it applies to order in one's life, order in every sphere of a person's existence, order in their finances, order in their relationship, order in their emotions, order in the way they keep their house, order. You know, once I got in the car of a man who wanted to be a spiritual leader. He really wanted to be a leader. He was going to give me a ride across town. And when I got in the car, I was so stunned at what I saw inside his car. There was trash in the back seat, and I could see cat hair or dog hair all over the car. 
And he apologized and he said, oh, I'm so sorry, I haven't cleaned out my car today. And I remember thinking, today? You've got to be kidding me. This isn't today. This has been like this for months. And when I got out of that car, my pants were covered with dog hair and cat hair. It just clung statically to my pants. And I remember thinking, you know, it's a good thing I rode across town with that man. Because if that man thinks that's normal, hmm, he and I probably would not have been a very good fit on a leadership team. He didn't have order in his life. He was letting things go. Paul said to Timothy, look at a person very practically. The purpose is not to judge them. It is to estimate whether or not they have what they need to lead something. If they don't have order in their personal life, how are they going to replicate order in a department of the church? So Paul says they need to be of good behavior or the Greek word cosmos, they need to have order in their life. Then he said, given to hospitality, which is a Greek word, which means a love of strangers. They treat guests well. It's an open home mentality. Then he said apt to teach the Greek word, which means a communicator, understanding that people are watching you and everything you do is communicating a message to those that are watching. When you are a leader, you have to understand that you're in the pulpit all the time. You may not be standing on the stage. You may be driving your car. You may be walking through the grocery store aisle, but people are watching you. Your life is your pulpit. And when you are a leader, you have to understand you are communicating all the time. Leadership is all about communication. And those that are put in positions of leadership need to have an understanding of that. But then in the following verse, Paul says, not given to wine, par oinas, from the word para, which means alongside the word oinas, which is the Greek word for wine. It describes a person that is alongside of wine, alongside of a bottle, or a person that has a dependency upon alcohol or some kind of a chemical addiction. What a good word for us today when it seems like chemical addictions and alcoholism is abounding. Today, people can buy alcohol nearly in every restaurant, even in convenience stores. It is so available today. And not just alcohol, but chemicals and medications and drugs of every kind. What a problem this is today in our world. And this verse, I believe, has real pertinence for us in our time. Leaders need to be free of chemical addictions. Why is this so important? Because if you're not free, how are you going to minister freedom to somebody else? You can't minister freedom if you're bound. And now Paul says it's very important that those who are in positions of leadership are not given to wine. And then he says, no striker. We saw in the previous program, this Greek word plectes really described a person that slapped or struck. And in the early church, a lot of the people who became leaders were slaves. Their masters already slapped them. Their masters had always beat them. And now when they became leaders, that's the only style of leadership they knew. So many in the early church were slapping church members. They were striking people they didn't agree with in the church. And Paul says, no, 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 no. You can't behave like that in the church. But for our purposes, it describes somebody that is emotionally explosive, temperamentally explosive. It is so hard to follow somebody that is unpredictable emotionally. You never know what they're going to be like when they show up. Are they going to be happy? Are they going to be sad? Do you please them? Do you displease them? You cannot predict their behavior. And when people are trying to follow someone like that, it makes it very difficult to serve. You can't think about your ministry because you're worried about your leader. What's he going to be like when he shows up today? This just creates a difficult situation. So Paul says anybody installed into leadership cannot be temperamentally explosive. They cannot be a striker. But then he says patient. The word patient, the Greek word epiakes, means restrained. He must be able to restrain his emotions. He must be able to restrain his mouth. The Bible tells us in James chapter 3 that a wise man, a mature man, is a person that is able to control his tongue. Leaders can't say everything that comes into their head. They just can't do that. Leaders have to be restrained. Furthermore, he says, not a brawler. The word brawler is the Greek word amakos. The word a has a canceling effect. The word makos is from makomai. The word makomai means to fight or to war. 
usually it means to have a war of words. When you compound the two words together, it's one who wrangles with words, conversations filled with strife. But in this particular case, because a little a is connected to the front of the word, it depicts one who refuses, refuses to fight with words, one who refuses to wrangle with words, one who refuses to be drawn into a battle of words. He just refuses to do it, turns away every opportunity to get dragged into a verbal confrontation. When you are a leader, like it or not, there are moments when people want to fight. And as a leader, you have to be patient. The Greek word epia case, you have to be restrained. Secondly, not a brawler. You have to make a decision. I don't care what anybody else says to me. I'm not going to be dragged into a war of words. And remember that when you're dragged into a war of words, it brings you down to a low level. Don't go there. You're better than that. God has called you to be higher than that. Just don't go there. Paul says to Timothy, a leader cannot behave like that. Then he adds, not covetous. Covetous is the Greek word phil arguros. It means a love of money or a preoccupation with material possessions. But this is the word a phil arguros. That a has a canceling effect. So rather than this person having a love of money or having a fixation on material possessions and material goods, he does not have a love of money. He does not have a fixation on material possessions. His heart is very free of all that. Leaders cannot have money as the motivation for their ministry. They just can't. It's not allowed. Money is not our motivating factor. But when you come to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, it says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Desire, desire quality, number one. Verse 2. A bishop then must be blameless, number two. The husband of one wife, quality, that's quality number three. Vigilant, number four. He must be sober, that's number five. He must be of good behavior, that's number six. Given to hospitality, that's number seven. Apt to teach, that's number eight. Then you come to verse three. Not given to wine, that's quality number nine. Not a striker or not emotionally explosive, that's number 10. Patient, that's number 11. Not a brawler, that's number 12. And finally, not covetous. Number 13. So in the first three verses, we have 13 qualifications that are required of anyone who's going to serve as a leader in God's house. Do you have these? I'm sure you do. If you don't, you can develop them in your life. God wants to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, you, I'm calling you to be a visible leader in my house. I want to give you a position of leadership. I'll be back in just a moment and I'm going to pray for you. Are there qualifications God requires for you to serve in any position of His kingdom? What are qualities that impress God? Do you have them? If not, how can you develop them? In Qualifications for Leadership, you'll find you are exactly the kind of person God wants to use. In this 10-part series, you'll learn the most important ingredient to be used by God, how to possess qualities that impress God, how to get from where you are to the place where you can be used by God. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $20. This series will show you what traits God is most interested in for the people that He uses, and you'll learn how to develop them. In addition to this teaching series, you can also purchase the book, Promotion. To be a leader, you don't have to be perfect, but you must be willing to grow. In this book, Rick answers hard questions about the character traits you need to get a promotion in any area of life. Each chapter reveals the keys you need for personal growth, as well as the non-negotiable traits that determine if you or someone else is ready to progress in rank, position, or influence. With promotion, you'll learn how to achieve your desired success. This powerful book can be yours for this limited time, so order your copy today for just $18. Don't miss this special offer, Qualifications for Leadership and Promotion. Call now or go to renner.org to order. Hey, this is Rick Renner. This is where I sit every morning, where I meet with the Lord and I pray for our TV family, our partners, people that I love all over the world. It takes hours and hours and hours to make sure I've put everything together correctly for you. 
And then from here, it goes to the TV suite where I sit down with my producer. And then he and I go over all the introductions that I have filmed in. So good to do these programs for the people who watch us all over the world. This is our studio. This really is where I live my life. And in this room, we prepare programs that ultimately go to multiple languages all over the face of the earth. They're primarily Russian and English. Wow, what a blessing. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 10, verse 21, that the lips of the righteous feed many. It's my prayer that our teaching is feeding and nourishing many people. And we create a teaching program for you. And our goal is to bring teaching that you can trust. That's our goal. That's my prayer. And I want to say thank you to you for helping all of us do it. It's not just me and Denise. There's a whole team here together. We're all committed to bringing good teaching to people. And your part's very important. So thank you for being a partner. Thank you for praying for us. And thank you for giving. This program literally just flew by. It's over and it seems like we just got started. But we're going to be back tomorrow and we're going to see the next qualifications which Paul gives us in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And these are the qualifications having to do with family and children. Wow, it is really important and we're going to learn a lot together. But I'm offering you my series which is called Qualifications for Leadership. It's 10 parts. It comes in multiple formats and it comes with a great study guide. You know I love these study guides. You know that I do because I tell you every day. Be sure to order the study guide as well. And we're offering you my book, which is called 10 Guidelines to Help You Achieve Your Long-Awaited Promotion. Powerful principles to help you determine if you or someone else is ready to be promoted into new realms of authority and responsibility. This book is so good. The back of the book says wisdom to help and prepare you for all that God has destined you to be. You know, it's such a pleasure to come to you every day and open our Bibles and study together. And I want to say thank you for letting me come right into your space. I know you don't have to watch this program or you could watch something else, but you're allowing me to come right into your space. And I count that to be an honor and I want to say thank you. And let me pray for you. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for your call on our lives. Lord, give us desire to get up and become something. To reach forward to become all that you want us to be. I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Remember Ecclesiastes 8 verse 4. It says, where the word of a king is, there's power. You know I love that verse. The Word of God has power, so let it work in your life today, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for watching this broadcast. For more information on product resources or to learn how you can partner with this ministry, please connect with us at runner.org. Also, please be sure to visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.